So let's move on to the elbow. Uh, talk a little bit about technical aspects. So uh, this patient had lateral elbow pain, Eliora. What do you think is going on here? Okay, so lateral elbow, I see edema in the lateral uh, radial head and lateral, yes, epicondyle, yes. Okay, here's a fat sac T2. Mm -hmm. And so we decided that uh, we're concerned here, so we've got a stir sequence. And here's what the stir sequence shows. You're not seeing the edema in those areas anymore. Mm. Could that be some? <laughs> so, no, I don't. one technical thing you've got to be very careful about uh, on the elbow is that you can get a lot of field inhomogeneity, depending upon the scanners, and coil artifact, depending upon the kind of coils that are used, and they vary a lot in this area. Uh, here's an area where we have field inhomogeneity, and these areas, the actual uh, the area of fat suppression, uh, the fat has changed the field as such that the fat within the uh, proximal diaphysis of the femur and the subcutaneous fat is no longer resonating at the frequency that you think it's going to resonate in, and therefore the fat suppression pulse is not suppressing. So this is failure of fat suppression there. Here's an area where actually... We have loss of signal intensity within the muscle. This is an area where it's water that we're getting the signal from. So that's changed in, in its uh, frequency so that now water is resonating where the computer thinks fat should be. And so we're getting inadvertent water separation here. And this is kind of an in-between area. And what happens is that this is masking the underlying pathology. <clears throat> so you will see all the time in a lot of the images that we do in the elbow and the wrist and other tissues where on the margins you'll have failure of fat suppression and usually you just ignore that. But uh, but you often have to think twice when you see those kind of artifacts to make sure that you're not having an artifact that can suppress this partial tear of the common extensor tendon that we'll talk about, you guys already know about. So... Uh, so the technical aspects are, are important. And this is just inadvertent water uh, uh, saturation, which causes us to not be able to see this tear of the common extensor tendon, or lateral epicondylitis. Okay. All right, arthrography. Um. Looking at the, is that the medial elbow? Well, the one on the left is a T2. The one on the right is a PD fat set. Okay, so, it's, so this is a T1 weighted image. Okay. T2 weighted image and PD fat set image. Um, I think I see some increased signal common uh, flexor origin. Right. Over here. Yeah. Yeah, that's just kind of, if we if we look at the signal intensity within the arthrography, uh, you should have bright signal, right? If you put in contrast. Yeah. On the T1-weighted image, we're getting bright signal here on the PD fat set. Uh, but on T2, it's very dark. So why are we not getting the contrast that we would expect from the, from the, uh, uh, from the contrast injection. Uh, is it too concentrated? All right. So this is too concentrated. This is a one-to-one -one dilution and not a one-to-200 dilution, which is what, uh, what I recommend. Uh, so just remember that we, we saw this in the shoulder and... Uh, uh, Wait, wait a little bit, then re-image? Yeah, if you're there at the scanner, which none of us are, <laughs> you can say, <laughs> yeah. okay, let's take the patient off, do the next patient, bring the patient back on, put them on the scanner, and get the get the proper scan. But uh, John, is, is the positioning kind of peculiar here? Yeah, it is. 
Right. And that's probably because the patient has pain. Could be. Yeah, there's this difficult. Or a position. shoulder problem. Couldn't have shoulder problem. Sure could. That's right, John. All right. Uh, so looking at the radius, it looks like there's some increased signal, approximately. Okay, we're not in through there, yep. right? Uh, but on the T1, it looks like it's pretty normal here. Mm -hmm. Here are the sagittals. So what do you think is going on here? Uh, it still looks like there's increased signal there. It's not in an area where I would expect you know, failure of fat saturations. Good. Not. I think there is increased signal that's real there. Yeah. So uh, this is normal bone marrow. Uh, in fact, this is one, one area in the extremities where even when you get older, you continue to have uh, hematopoietic marrow. So it's very common to have something that looks like edema here uh, in this particular area of the proximal uh, uh, radius. And uh, it bothered me a lot for a long time when we were doing elbows, looking for uh, injuries at the distal insertion of the long head of the, of the biceps tendons. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, for a while, I would call traction injuries here, but this is this is just normal. Yeah, so you have to be a little bit careful of that. Okay. Okay. So this is a this is a T one. It's a T one. Sagittal. Okay, that looks like uh, displacement of the fat pads, maybe a joint, a joint effusion. So it's just a typical effusion. I've, I've seen it called other things, but good. That's just uh, anatomy. So let's talk about a few congenital things. One is the medial and coneus muscle and the lateral plica here. All right, so... Uh, medially adjacent to the ulnar nerve. I guess we have an accessory uh, epitropiaris so muscle. There's the ulnar nerve, and there's a muscle that actually shouldn't be there, and that's the medial ancaneus or the ancaneus epitropiaris muscle. And uh, this can this can produce compression on the uh, ulnar nerve and produce ulnar nerve palsies here. And this is what the normal should look like. Now, if you go proximal to this or distal to this, you will see muscles back here. Uh, but right at the level of the uh, 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 posterior to the uh, uh, to the medial epicondyle here, uh, you really shouldn't have a muscle back in this location. So, and then you can also see it as an abnormal uh, uh, muscle on the uh, sagittal and the coronal images. And here you can see where there's a little bit of compression of the ulnar nerve and the cubital tunnel uh, right at the level of the ancaneus epitrochlearis. Actually, a very good friend of mine's daughter had uh, ulnar neuropathy, and this was not picked up on the person who read the, her MR scan. Uh, but he showed it to me. We picked it up. They decided that this was probably a cause of their symptoms. They went in and surgically removed it to decompress the ulnar nerve. And then clinically, nothing changed. <laughs> so, okay. So here are kind of the normal muscles. If we go distally, you can see musculars back here, which are the flexor muscles where they uh, attach. And then if we, well, Actually, so here we go. Now, what do you think here? Fortunately, has anybody done studies with uh, uh, a patient um, contracting their muscles and then do an MRI of the area? I'm not aware of anyone publishing that study. It would be an interesting thing to do, I think, John. But uh, I, th aware I of that. think it would be because. We always look at a relaxed muscles and uh, right in this in this situation, you, well, you can see the swollen or 
or uh, atrophied uh, on their nerve, but uh, I think that'd be a good one. Yeah. To, to, to study. Yeah, I like that. So this is a low field scanner. All right, so looking at the ulnar nerve, it looks thickened and increased in signal on the STIR imaging and looks yeah. like there's... STIR here, and then we can see a, yep. a muscle back there. Yep. And so this is commonly called ulnar entrapment. We have a coronal stir. This has to be the bad side. Okay. Mm. I think this is a T1 fat side with contrast. Okay. That's a fat side. Right? Yeah. So the thing I'm concerned about is what's going on over here. Is there some articular cartilage defect? Well, I don't see the cartilage real well. There's this little thing here. If we go to the sagittal images, we can see it coming in here. Okay, so some some fibrous tissue, maybe. So this plica. Is, yeah, plica. Yeah, so this is called plica, and uh, some people call this the lateral fringe syndrome where you get a little fringe of soft tissue going in there. But uh, see, there's a lot of fringe sensors, and the plica should be, if the plica gets greater than 2.6 millimeters in thickness from uh, 2013 Skeletal Radiology Journal. Uh, I, I must tell you, I, I find that the vast majority of time when I've been considering this diagnosis, when you call it the clinician, it that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the patient's symptom complex. So I, quite frankly, have stopped calling it unless it's very obvious, where you, you can't not call it, uh, which is pretty rare. Okay. All right. Closer lateral elbow pain and catching. Um... I guess at the uh, radio cap teller joint, there might be uh, some abnormal soft tissue within the joint space. Yeah, maybe a oh, lateral hole. Right there. Like that, right in there. And then if we go to the uh, axial images, we can see it right in through here. And uh, this, this was thought here, it's this area back in here. This was thought to be an acquired plaque, plica. They did arthroscopy on this elbow, removed it, and the symptoms went away. So I guess it can be real. All right, so we have a 27-year-old with bilateral deformity and chronic pain. Uh, it looks like there's a chronic appearing deformity of that elbow joint, a joint of fusion. You know, there's fusion of the Radius and ulna. Yeah, and then here we can see on the axial images. Mm -hmm. And this is a congenital uh, radial ulnar fusion. Okay, let's move on to tendons and ligaments. We'll start with the lateral, then we'll go to the medial, then we'll talk about the biceps and the triceps. So there's a big difference between medial and lateral injuries to the uh, elbow. And uh, soft in in injuries to people like us is about 95% on the lateral side. And the, by far the most common one we typically call a tennis elbow. Uh, medial image in injuries are pretty much limited to elite throwing athletes. They tend to be uh, more significant. Uh, and that's due to the massive valgus forces in the late cocky and early acceleration phase of throwing. And this causes tears of the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. You can get flexor muscle tendon tears and lateral bony impaction injuries. So we're going to talk about these. By far, in my experience of, people, of normal human beings that aren't high-level athletes who have elbow pain, it's due to either two things. One, degenerative 
disease. You know, you can have fractures, but they're not common for for us. But by, by far the most common is a tear to the common extensor tendon at its origin. And uh, you know, we'll talk about those. So that's 95% uh, here. So let's first talk about the athletes, because they're the most important ones uh, in our high-level athletic population that we have to evaluate. And let's talk a little bit about the throwing mechanism. Uh, so this comes from uh, Frank Job, uh, where he divided the throwing uh, in, uh, primarily in his work with the Dodgers uh, over the years. Uh, the mechanism, you start with the wind-up, where you put the arms above the head, and then there's you separate the hands after you bring them down. Then you have the early cocking phase, uh, then the late cocking phase, and uh, when you do the late cocking, then you start accelerating the ball forward, and then there's the release point, and then there's the follow-through coming down. Is it uh, Dodgers or Ang Angels, John? Uh, he was a Dodgers. Uh, not, I don't think he ever worked with the Angels. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, yeah, what happened in... Yeah, it, was, and it really started out with Curlin. Curlin was a big baseball fan, and when the Dodgers moved from New York, he used to go over and watch their practices. And just like you were saying, John, in those days, the team doctors were just general practitioners. They weren't orthopedic surgeons. And he was sitting in the stands at a, a practice game, and uh, one of the coaches saw this guy, and you see him day in and day out. So he went over to him and asked him what he did, and he told him he was an orthopedic surgeon. And they, uh, and they said, well, you know, we've, we've been thinking about trying to get an orthopedic surgeon associated with the team, and that's how it started. And uh, so, uh, so Curlin started working with the team, and then when Job came, he was primarily an upper extremity person, and uh, Curlin was more interested in the lower extremities and the knees, so Job kind of took over because most of the difficult injuries were the ones we're talking about right now, and they were more in the in the upper extremities. Yeah, uh, Curlin had an ankylosing spinalitis, and right uh, at one time I met him, and uh, uh, he wanted me to do his hip surgery, and I I uh, declined because I wasn't going to break my vacation. And ah. He said, "Well, I'll call you there and." bring you back. I said, no, thank you. I, I need, <laughs> need a vacation. Yeah. So uh, my associate, uh, well, uh, kind of a, yeah. a guy I worked with, uh, Marmer did his hip and it yeah. fell apart in the ear. Yeah. Well, Curlin and I spoke right after with kind of in tandem at a, at a medical meeting when I was really young and we had dinner together that night. Uh, he had difficulty standing because of his ankylosing spondylitis, and that's when he told me his story about how he first started working in sports medicine. Yeah, so it's interesting. So yeah, one, one, one thing about him, he had a loud voice. Yeah, right. He didn't need the microphone like I did. Okay, so so let's take a look here. So th this is really that late cocking phase. This is an, uh, an angel player, well, as you can see. Uh, so first, all of you try to put your arm in that position. <laughs> no, you got to get it way back. You have to have a, it has to be perfect no, don't to, to the don't back. Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> well, none of us can get in that position. And actually, this pitcher for the Angels couldn't get his left arm in that position either. So I think we've already talked a little bit about this, but we're going to talk more detail now. So I'll really bore you. Uh, and that's in a, you have to get in that position. And therefore, virtually all Major League Baseball pitchers who have been able to make it uh, uh, to that level started pitching uh, uh, less than 13 years of age. And the reason for that is in the uh, early, in, in like from 10 to 14, if you do a lot of pitching, you, the actual anatomy of the pitching shoulder and the humerus changes. You actually get a rotation of the humerus along the long axis. That's what allows you to get into this position. 
uh, and we'll talk about a few other physiologic changes. And the reason why that's important is uh, when you release the ball, you release it uh, when, the, when the hand gets about here. If you're like me and you can only get your arm back to here, and then you try to put momentum on the ball, you only have like 10 degrees of arc to put momentum on that ball. But if you get it way back here, you've got over 90 degrees of arc to be able to put continuous force on that ball to get more momentum on it and have a 100 mile per hour fastball. So you literally can't pitch in the major leagues unless you develop a deformity of the humerus while you're still a kid. Uh, I also think that they're they're born with a, that uh, anatomy to be able to do it. Okay. And when you get in this position, you have a lot of forces on the elbow. There are distractive forces on the medial side, as you can see when you go back to cock it, and you've got compression forces uh, on the lateral side, and those can produce injuries to the to the elbow that we're going to be talking about. So this was a game uh, that I went to a number of years ago. When I worked with the with the Angels, I used to go to quite a few games and, and stay in the dugout and so forth. But, but uh, I snuck a, uh, a movie camera into the game this particular time. This was against the uh, uh, the Boston Red Sox, and I came from Boston, so I was a big Red Sox fan. Uh, but I, I just want to go through uh, this. And by the way, that was a home run. So if the pitcher is now looking at the ball going over the, the field. And we we had a great season that year, over 100 games, a lot like the Dodgers, but the, the Red Sox took us out. I think they went on to win the World Series that, that year. So let's go back and we can see that entire mechanism of going through the throwing uh, that, uh, that Job popularized. There we can see there's the wind up and he cocked it, the hand separation. The early cocking phase comes in here and then the late cocking phase is there. So again, he gets in that position just like that other picture did where we can't. So let me just show you. This is between two frames. So there's a little bit of motion of the hand between those two frames. Look how much motion occurs in the next single frame. The hand goes from all the way there to all the way here where he's released the ball. So there's a lot of uh, angular motion that occurs right there before you release the ball, as you would expect. And though that means there are tremendous forces on the elbow and the shoulder going from that cock phase to the release phase in uh, uh, just a fraction of a second. And then you can follow it all the way through the rest of the way. You did say immediately it's a distraction force. Is that right? Immediately oh. So if we go to the cocking phase right here, when you go back to cock, what happens is uh, you, you're going backwards and then, then you change the momentum and you go forwards again. So, But when you get to that far stage, you have uh, distraction forces on the medial, compression forces on the, on the other ones, then the muscles, muscles contract and reverse it when you go through the throwing mechanism. But if you do that over and over again, you keep banging the lateral side and distracting the medial side, and we'll see the injuries that that causes. Human beings were not born to do this. Yeah, right. right. And some of us can't do it now. Uh, so uh, that's, so, that's what I mean, John. Yeah. Uh, these, are, these guys are born that way. Yeah. So we'll, we'll start looking at the anatomy of the ligaments, tendons, and muscles. Let's go through some of the pain syndromes uh, first. So uh, this is from an article in Skeletal Radiology where they talk about the different uh, pain syndromes primarily involving the lateral aspect of the elbow. So if you have lateral elbow pain, uh, this is what you're uh, looking for. So there's posterior lateral plica syndrome, uh, which is basically the fringe syndrome we were talking about before. Posterior lateral rotor rotary instability, lateral epicondylitis, a term I don't like because uh, it really leads to the wrong concept about the pathophysiology and the wrong treatment. Uh, radial nerve entrapment, Panner's disease in young kids, capitular osteochondritis, desiccans in a little bit older kids, and radiocapitular overload syndrome. So 
Uh, let's go ahead. So the lateral anatomy. Well, you could say uh, lateral epicondylosis. Could. Yeah. I like that better. Why don't you start it? <laughs> there, there are enough words, there are enough phrases out there already anyway, but nobody listens to me anymore, John. So uh, that was Too late for me to area. do it. Yeah. yeah. So, so if we look laterally here, what we have is the radial head and the deep structures, we have the capsule and around the radial head uh, uh, here, we, we, well, we have the, going outward, we have the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which is the most important stabilizer of the lateral uh, <coughs> elbow. And we'll talk about injuries to this in a little bit. Then we have the radial collateral ligament, uh, which is really a thickening of that uh, lateral capsule uh, here on this side. And then the annular ligament, which is this ligament coming around here. And of all these structures, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament is actually the most important for lateral stability. And if you have uh, instability laterally, you can have tears of the radial collateral of the annular ligament, but it's really the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which is the important ligament uh, for stability. Uh, <clears throat> if we look on the lateral ligaments, we can see the radial collateral ligament coming across here, a thickening of the capsule. Lateral ulnar collateral ligament is a posterior structure. And then we have the uh, the annular ligament and uh, uh, some other soft tissue supports there. So on an MR examination, uh, uh, here's the medial side over here, here the lateral side over there, and here is that posterior lateral capsule here, and the lateral ulnar collateral ligament is going to attach up here. It's going to come down. It's going to come right on next to the radial head posteriorly and come down and attach right here to the uh, to the ulna. So this is actually the lateral ulnar collateral ligament and we're, we have to go to the next cut to see it actually go all the way into the uh, uh, to the humerus. And then here's uh, here's that posterior fringe here which I see all the time and quite honest with you I don't know a really good way of determining whether it's, whether it's significant or not, except clinically. So I'll, I'll mention it, uh, that one paper we said said that if it's more than 2.6 millimeters in thickness, then it's likely to be symptomatic. I'm, I'm not too comfortable with that. But on the other hand, uh, you can describe it, and then the, the clinician will have to compare it to the, the clinical symptoms to see what the significance is. I'm not an expert in this, but... Putting down a number like two and a half millimeters, I think it's kind of silly. Yeah. Whoever yeah. came up with that, I'm sorry that I said so, but that's the way I feel about it. Yeah, they just correlated that measurement with symptoms and came up statistically with yeah, it's the symptoms and what you. Uh, I think maybe um, what you see in terms of contrast. Uh, mm -hmm. of the tissue around that area uh, versus the plica that, yeah. uh, that's important uh, and findings uh, by the doctor. Yeah, right. So in here we can see with an arthrogram, we can see that also very well. So it's something I think to describe, but I wouldn't actually give it as a diagnosis. I would just state that you have a, a, a plica present and kind of describe what it is. Uh, there, and uh, the diagnosis really has to be made clinically. It looks like a fold of uh, capsular tissue. I, I uh, um, synovial tissue. Yeah. So looking at the posterior lateral plica syndrome, or what some people call the fringe syndrome, typically occurs in 20 to 40 year olds from chronic, chronic twisting uh, type injuries in this location, and the pain is really back here in the posterior lateral uh, corner of the of the uh, elbow. And some people feel that you can see inflammatory changes and increased vascularity in that particular area. Okay, so uh, here's a patient. Here is an axial old uh, uh, T1 weighted image. 
And here we can see this is actually the lateral ulnar collateral ligament coming posterior to the radius, radial head, where it attaches to the ulna kind of distally. Then it comes over laterally, comes more proximally up, and then attaches to the, to the humerus. And uh, this area where it attaches here is called the supernator crest. So that's the supernator crest. So that's an intact one. Usually, in my experience, what if it tears, it tears back here where it attaches to the supernator crest. Who's next? Uh, you? Okay, yeah. Tayson, go for it. So this is a patient who had a uh, an elbow injury. All right, so the um, lateral and collateral ligament looks torn and lax. Okay. Um, so here we see the radial head, right? Really the level of the radial head or a little distal to that. We see what looks like a nice uh, uh, normal uh, ligament to structure coming down here and then it becomes discombobulated yeah. and thickened. And it's no longer taut and then here's a supernator crest. So that's what we're seeing there. And uh, uh, so, yeah. this turned out to be a tear of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament as well as a tear of the annular ligament in this particular patient. Okay. Oh, wait a second, I'm sorry. My error. This is a little bit more proximal with the level of the annular head, and this was actually an annular tear. And then if we actually look uh, on the coronal images, we could follow the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and it was intact. So this is a pretty... Uh, rare situation where there is an annular ligament tear, but the lateral old and collateral ligament was still intact. Okay. Sorry about I'm that. I've never repaired one. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we have a 36 year old with elbow dislocation. Again, looks like there's a tear of that annular ligament. Yep. And yep. a lot of edema. Okay, 14-year-old okay, sports injury. <clears throat> okay. This it looks like me the the radial collateral ligament is torn. So we can see that there's some bone edema. Um, um, and remember, this is a 14 year old. And oh, um, yeah. So, so the ligament is less likely to be torn, I guess. So, maybe in a bone. I'm going to take a piece of bone with it. So, so here you can see that there is some bone edema here. You have this structure that looks like it's been pulled off. Maybe there's a little cortic cortical bone here. And then you can see that this is going distally down here where it's going to go around the, uh, the basically the neck of the humerus and attach over here to the supernator crest. So this is actually an avulsion of the uh, uh, lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And uh, typically... Um, yeah. Avulsion fracture. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> a case like that, you, you it certainly looks like there's certainly bone injury here. So this, as John said, probably is a, a fracture. It looks like the uh, cortical bone is missing in this location. So it probably is a fracture. If you needed to confirm that, it's it would be worthwhile getting a CT scan. Oh, now it's stretch hand. Okay. Uh, you know, I think, let me say that, I think a minute ago I said lateral ulnar collateral ligaments, most of the injuries I saw were down where it attaches to the ulna. Uh, I didn't mean that. Most of the ones I've seen have been where it attaches here to the humerus. Okay. All right, so looks like the lateral ulnar collateral ligament is torn proximally and uh, retracted. Okay. Yeah, it looks like this is attracted down here. And then if we look on the axial images, what do you see here? Uh, are we looking at the 
annular ligament. So, well, we're actually below the radial head here. This is actually the cortex of the bone. Okay. You can see that because the next cut proximal, you'll actually see that it gets larger. This is the supinator crest. Okay. So this is actually the, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. It's torn and it's displaced down here and abnormally thickened, which we can see over here. Okay. And again, here we can see it coming down here. Maybe there's a little injury at the supinator crest as well, but it's really displaced over here. So this is a, a torn, displaced lateral ulnar collateral ligament. So this patient's going to have a lateral instability. Okay, now we can talk about posterior lateral rotatory instability. Uh, and here is what we can see is that there, here there's a, a tear. In this case, this is more the uh, radial collateral ligament. And here it's, again, young patient. It's primarily a bone injury where it attaches to the bone. Uh, we can also see uh, an injury to the common extensor tendon here, which can occur with these as well. And if we look at the uh, the anatomy here, as far as the more external structures, um, here we can see the supinator muscle over here, uh, which helps supinate the forearm. The biceps is probably a more important, stronger supinator. <laughs> and then we have the three components of the common extensor tendon, the extensor digitorum communis, the more distal, the extensor carpi radialis brevis, which is in the middle, which is the one generally initially torn, and then the radialis longus, uh, which attaches more proximally. No, the, the brevis is the bad guy. Yeah, the brevis is the one that usually is the symptomatic one early on in disease that we want to pick up early. And chronal one of the sur I'm sorry, John. One of the surgeries is to incise that Okay, so there's a digitorum distally. Uh, here is a case. This is a patient who actually had symptoms. This is where the brevis inserts is right in that location. And we see there's a lot of fluid collection there. And that's because there's a tear of the brevis in this location. And then uh, uh, the longest comes up and attaches more proximally here. Okay. Is it you? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so we have a 39 year old acute pain after heavy lifting. Uh, looks like there's a lot of soft tissue thickening and scarring kind of laterally there. Yeah. Right. And then you can notice that there is some increased signal intensity here. We can see back in that area. And this was a strain of the muscle. Well, you can see that there's a lot of chronic injury here. Yeah. This patient's had uh, partial tears of the common extensor tendon healed by the typical thickening that we've talked about over and over again. Mm -hmm. So this is acute. This guy looks like a weight, weight lifter. Yeah. Okay. And then there's lateral epicondylitis, which is not epicondylitis. Rarely, it rarely involves the epicondyle. And it's not an inflammatory lesion, so it's a complete misnomer. Epicondylosis. Yeah, right. And here is the common extensor tendon, and it's really primarily almost 90% of the time, it's a tear of the tendon at its insertion to the bone, which, in, and this is typically seen in, a, in adults, uh, middle aged people. Uh, when you start getting tendinosis of the tendons, it become weakens, and that's the weakest point. It's the tendon, not, not the bone at this stage. You can occasionally see it in younger people, in which case you can get edema within the bone as well. But this is primarily a tendon-bone interface tear, uh, not inflammatory. Uh, let's see. What do you think of this one, Elior? Okay, 54. Um, okay, on the AP view on the left, looks like there's a bone fragment along the lateral epicondyle or... donor size for the bone fragment? No, not really. So this is actually soft tissue calcification. 
Okay. But it's in the area of the common sense of tendon. And then this was uh, uh, HADD disease of the common extensor tendon. And, you know, there's a lot of debate as to what this caused. I, I really think that, that these are most of the time caused by partial tears of the tendon. And in the healing phase, the biochemistry of the healing reaction is just appropriate for calcium phosphate to, to condense into the soft tissues uh, and develop these. Uh, it's much more common in the shoulder, which we see all the time. Uh, but you can get it anywhere where you get injuries. And as you know, I've already shown in other lectures, uh, people who first get tears, then they're followed up for years afterwards, and the calcium develops in the same areas where the partial tear was. And in time, these can then ossify from just dystrophic calcification. Uh, uh, they can actually ossify I think that's the source of a lot of the, what are often called normal variant ossicles, which we see. But again, I've talked about that in the past. Okay, this is a low field scanner. Patient had a middle-aged person with elbow pain. All right, so I see increased signal at the origin of the common extensor. Yeah. And, I, and again, this is primarily that, that proximal part of the lateral epicondyle there. This is predominantly the uh, the brevis, but I think this is also extending more approximately into the into the communis, right there. So this is a uh, so uh, if it's kind of mild but symptomatic, it's common extensor tendinosis. If you we did a study a number of, I don't know, five years ago where we looked at 186 adults who had no symptoms in their elbows and looked at them and uh, Typically, if it's this bright on a, a stir sequence, we don't see them in asymptomatic individuals, but you'll often get uh, gray signal intensity on T1, which is kind of gray, kind of like muscle signal intensity on the stir in asymptomatic individuals. So uh, mild signal changes typically are not symptomatic but I think they are the degenerative disease which weakens the tendon, which is a precursor to actually uh, significant interstitial tears, uh, which are the first symptomatic phase of this disease. It's trauma. It's repetitive trauma. And remember, these are the extensor attachments, which means the culprit is not the elbow. You injure this by extending the wrist. And I'll talk about my experience with this disease, which is more than once. Uh, the the treatment for these is, is best by immobilizing the wrist and keeping from using the extensor tendons, allowing that to allow this to heal. Especially at night. Especially at night. Okay, thanks, John. Um, I, I forgot to mention something. Um, where you have a, a, a slight avulsion of the extensors in that area of the epicondyle. I've, I've been there surgically more, more than once, probably around 10 times. And what all you find is granulation tissue, um, and especially if they've had in, injections. Thank you. All right, so here it looks like we have Pretty extensive thickening and increased signal in that common extensor tendon to origin and some edema in the adjacent epicondyle. So. Yeah. So the old fashioned ep ep epicondylitis, I think that's what most people call this. But again, I think this is a chronic uh, repeat traction injury uh, to the tendon. Okay, elbow dislocation. Uh, looking at the lateral elbow, there's uh, looks like there's a tear of that. Well, first of all, you want to say that it's relocated. Yes. Okay. Um, this structure is this a common common extensor tendon, proximal? So. So here what we see is this is the, the communis part. This is the most distal part. This is, would be the uh, brevis, and the longest would be attaching up in here. 
And then th this is also uh, almost certainly going to tear the uh, <coughs> radio collateral ligament here, which is the lateral capsule in this location, which allows joint fluid to extend into the attachment site of the common extensor tendon, in this case, the communis. But uh, we know this patient had a dislocation, but then we could also see edema within the soft tissues on the medial side as well. When you see bilateral uh, pathology, the first thing that should come in your mind is going to be a dislocation. Then you need to look at the surrounding soft tissues, looking carefully at the major vessels and the nerves. Uh, uh, so this is a, a communis uh, tear in this particular patient on the on the lateral side. But you can clearly see the the two two of the three components of the common extensor tendon here. Okay. Uh, here again, we have some fluid type signal uh, in that common extensor tendon in origin peripherally. Yeah. yeah. And so th this is the classic finding that we see in most of the early patients with, uh, quote, lateral epicondylitis, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually a tear of the attachment of the brevis uh, tendon. And the reason I'm emphasizing tear is that historically, uh, one of the common treatments for this is to inject it with steroids. Now, we all know the steroids do a lot of things. One is they mask pain, which made the patients very happy. Uh, but the other thing it does is it, it actually delays healing and can convert an acute injury into more of a chronic problem. So there have been studies looking at this, and steroids make patients feel better, if the patient doesn't have a lot of pathology, it won't affect it enough. The patient will feel better by the time they get into doing things. It, they, they won't have symptoms again. So there is some. But, but overall, uh, uh, recent studies have shown that steroids are not very effective at treating this condition. There have been a number of papers that have uh, uh, used uh, uh, concentrated platelets, uh, uh, PRP, uh, including one that was done here uh, locally that was published that got a lot of press. None of those papers actually are really very good. Um, none of them have control groups, and you really can't show anything unless you really have a control group. And most of the recent uh, studies have shown that the earlier uh, studies without control groups from a small population that showed PRP uh, had an advantage uh, basically have shown that PRP is not very good for treating this. The one thing they have to realize, if you think about the pathophysiology, how does PRP work, there are subpapers that say it works by anti-inflammatory uh, uh, ways, but that's not the way PRP works. PRP, there are platelets, the, comp the, the uh, chemicals in those platelets actually are very strong pro-inflammatory devices, and Typically, if it works, the way it should work is it should increase inflammation, which increases uh, the tissue response for the healing mechanism and therefore produce a more robust healing response. Uh, and therefore, it typically should make it more symptomatic during the acute inflammatory stage uh, before it goes on to the healing stage. So there's a lot of confusion in this particular area right now. Yes, John. I injected uh, a couple of thousand people with uh, cortisone and used splinting and TLC, ice, et cetera, and um, rest as necessary. And uh, the people, if, if you are patient with the pa patients, um, uh, they improve or, and get well. I've, I've had patients come in that had pain for six months and I would inject them with a very long-acting um, steroid. And I used a wristospan. I'm not advertising it, uh, and it, uh, it 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 took care of a lot of patients. I'm not talking about sports. I'm talking about uh, ordinary people, housewives, for instance. Yeah. Thanks, John. I think there's a. There's been a lot of support for that. That was the standard for years. Uh, and, you know, there are just some questions about it right now, but we'll have to see yeah, I, what I, happens I, over time. I'm aware of that. But... Yeah. 
Vince, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that, but I don't, don't necessarily have to agree with them. Absolutely, you don't. That's right. We like controversy. My question is, does anyone have experience uh, in the literature or clinically with using nit localized nitroglycerin patches uh, for medial or lateral epicondylitis? Uh, I, I don't have any experience or knowledge about that. John, do you? Uh, I, I didn't understand that. Oh, uh, if you use localized nitroglycerin patches, I assume topically placed on it? Yeah, no, I don't think that using that is, it, that, that may work in the brain, but not on the tissue. Do you um, have the other thing is, uh, why not just use ice? And uh, that, that, that works very well. Yeah. Um, do, do, do you have so, experience with nitroglycerin? It didn't work on me, but yeah. Um, oh, you tried it. I tried it. I, I did the head steroid injection, which also didn't work. Yeah, j j just, just don't light it. Yeah, it nothing's in the helmet. Just, just don't put it on there and light it and explode the air. Okay. That, that, that's strictly pain control, uh, and it anesthetizes the skin. Uh, I don't know how far, how deep that goes. So, so as here, soon as the blood vessels get a hold of it, that it's dispersed all over the body. Okay. So here are the coronal images. Here are the axial images showing the typical partial tear with fluid there. Here are the sagittal images. There's the longus up there. There's the ECRB showing it's a typical location within the proximal ECRB. And here's the communis tendon, which is not involved typically in the early stages. And that's the tear. So uh, this was a study where they did needle tenotomies. This is another common treatment. We just stick needles in it and try to induce bleeding in that particular area. Uh, and so what they found is that if you did this with PRP, you got more vascularization, uh, but no change in, in the follow-up. And I think they actually had a control group in this, in this study, uh, which showed that the, the treatment was no better than conservative treatment therapy in this patient. Uh, okay, who's next? Uh, I think we jumped over me earlier. So, um, all right. So, looks like we have a tear of the more distal part of the common okay. extensor. Yeah. So here again, we have a tear of the common extensor. This would be tear. That's fine. And then. Uh, here's a case where we have a tear of the ECRB. The communis still is intact, though there's some tendinopathy there. But if you look at the ECRB, it's actually torn and displaced distally down to here. So you, you can get retraction in some of these. Uh, and there's a debate about whether this is more common and people have repeated steroid injections or not, but I don't think there's any data to, to prove that. Okay. Why don't we end with this case here? All right. So patient presents with elbow dislocation. And again, it looks like there is a tear of the radial collateral ligament. Um, and probably the common extensor tendon as well. And the lateral collateral ligament. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which, you, if you have a true dislocation, you're almost always going to tear the lateral. No, that, that's not reduced either. Mm -hmm. completely. And so there we can see the different tiers. And then uh, there is a. That's still, it's still sublux. Yeah. So, so why don't we stop here? And we'll pick up here and continue with injuries uh, on Thursday. Thursday, John. Yeah, yeah. We we changed it back again, John. I'm taking Wednesday afternoon off, uh, not Thursday, so it'll be back to our normal schedule this week. Okay. Uh, what are you gonna do? Uh, we're gonna have lecture again on Thursday. On Thursday, yeah, right. Tomorrow's Wednesday. Tomorrow's Wednesday, yeah. So, see you on Thursday. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a